two minutes. Thank you. Today we meet to mark up two bills. The first is called the Train Act, and the second is a draft of a bill that gives oil companies a free pass to pollute the air. Both bills are based on the premise that it is simply not possible to keep our air and water clean and still keep our economic engine chugging along. As we discuss these bills, I can't help but be reminded of the renowned children's story known as the little engine that could. But in this version of the story, Republicans want to cast EPA as the little engine that can't. I think I can, the EPA says, as it tries to defend our nation's rivers and lakes from becoming waste dumps. I think I can, the EPA says, as it tries to remove cancer-causing materials from smokestacks and oil rigs. But EPA needs help, so EPA asks for cleaner air. No, the Shell Oil Company says. Can't you see I'm too busy drilling to take out the particular matter and hydrocarbons? EPA, EPA asks for help making water safe to drink. No, says the coal industry. Can't you see I'm too weary from chopping mountaintops to worry about my arsenic lace sludge? EPA, EPA asks for help ridding the air of cancer-causing chemicals. No, says the chemical manufacturers. I have a busy day making plastics and pesticides, and I don't have time to worry about that. But EPA wouldn't give up. And the utility companies, oil industry, and chemical plants were not happy. No, not one bit. So they made a train act that says, I guess we can't protect our children. I guess we can't keep our water clean. I guess we can't keep uh, 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 the, uh, wa the air clean. These bills aren't trains that Americans should ride. They are train wrecks for our public health. Ending protections for clean air and clean water should be a third rail issue. But the Republican Tea Party Express that runs to Congress has veered off onto the far right track. Sadly, these are just the kind of anti-innovation, anti-science, anti-public health schemes the public has come to fear from this legislative wrecking crew. I yield back. Thank you very much for reminding us of the little engine that could. We appreciate that. This time I recognize the gentleman, from Mr. Virginia, uh, Mr. Griffith of Virginia. I would just want to make an announcement that uh, the Prime Minister of Israel is addressing a joint session of Congress at 11 a.m. We're going to recess for that, and then 10 minutes after that, we're going to come back. We're going to debate the amendments, and at 1 o'clock, we're going to roll all the amendments till 1, and we're going to vote at 1 o'clock, basically, on the amendments on this first bill. Mr. Griffith, you're recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, coming from the uh, state legislature, I learned uh, early on it's the obligation of legislators to accumulate information and have all the data present so that they can make decisions. Regrettably, I find in Congress that not only do we not want to accumulate the information, but for some reason we believe that the agencies of the administrative branch that were originally created by Congress should have more power than Congress itself. I, for one, do not believe that. I believe that Congress is where the, the decisions should be made. Um, and I think that without passing this bill and other bills like this, we are not doing our obligation to the voters, whether you're Democrat or Republican, we have an obligation to acquire this information. In my recent campaign, uh, one of the, my supporters, uh, Jim Farrar of Abingdon, Virginia, came up with a slogan that started showing up on pins and bumper stickers that said, who elected the EPA? Well, nobody elected the EPA, and our citizens, again, whether Democrat or Republican, liberal or conservative, expect the United States Congress to make the decisions and not some unelected bureaucrat. And last but not least, Mr. Chairman, I would point out that if we are talking about the little engine that could, we should remember its historical context. The little engine that could was a steam engine. The story first appeared in 1905, which means that today one can assume it used coal or wood to power it. And one would have to assume today that under the current regulatory scheme, when the little engine found out it couldn't make it up the hill and nobody else was willing to help it get up that hill, it would have to go to the EPA and ask for permission to use more energy because it was going to create a larger carbon footprint in order to get over that hill. So I would submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, we need to support this bill so the little engine that could could continue to bring jobs to the American public. Thank you. Mr. Griffith, thank you again for bringing up the little engine. And uh, this time we're going to recess uh, for the Prime Minister of Israel's remarks, and then we're going to reconvene 10 minutes after that. We'll debate the amendments and then roll them until 1 o'clock.
we're in recess. Recognize to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in almost every single bill introduced in this subcommittee under the banner of the so-called American Energy Initiative, which we just completed our eighth hearing on yesterday, my friends on the other side of the aisle have attempted to reduce the red tape and streamline the process to make it easier for all companies to drill without delay, even if it meant sidestepping the input of states and local communities. A case in point is the second bill we're marking up today, which attempts to make it easier for Shell to acquire the permits they need to begin drilling in the Outer Continental Shelf in Alaska in an expeditious manner by cutting out state and community input. Yet, uh, in place of this legislation, the Train Act, we have the majority attempting to do just the opposite, add an extra layer of red tape and create yet another committee to study the impacts of proposed EVA, EPA regulations to delay implementation, even though by law the agency is already required to do so. Unfortunately, uh, my friends on the other side of the aisle conveniently left off the health effects of the proposed regulations as one of the cumulative impacts that this bill would analyze. I understand that for some of my colleagues, uh, if a regulation cannot be monetized, that it has no benefit. But for many communities that do not have the money and connections of the oil and gas industries, there is no more important benefit than protecting their health and their livelihoods. So the amendment, the amendment that I am offering today will do precisely that. It will amend this bill to include important environmental protection and health agencies that were amended, that were omitted rather, from the original bill. My amendment would add the chair of the Council on Environmental Quality, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, as well as the director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, among others, to the interagency council that this bill would create. Additionally, my, my amendment would direct the committee to look at the important health impacts that would be affected by EPA's proposed rules, including asthma rates, birth defects, premature mortality, and the effect of promoting clean energy jobs and technologies. If some of my colleagues were worried that existing studies that have already been conducted, focus too heavily on, on health and environmental impacts of proposed EPA rules and did not sufficiently take into account the jobs and the economic analysis, analysis then let's not make the same mistakes on, on this bill. Let's make sure the committee established under this bill takes a balanced and unbiased approach if the majority feels that previous studies was indeed slanted. By including health and environmental impacts of proposed EPA rules, we can ensure that this bill enjoys the su support of a much larger coalition as it moves its way through the legislative process. So I urge all of my colleagues to support this amendment. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The chair recognized Mr. Griffith for comments on this amendment for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, my concern with this amendment and others like it in, in language in this regard is that uh, these amendments always want to look at the resulting reduction in uh, asthma by, by virtue of the um, new regulation. They want to look at the reduction in various types, birth defects, et cetera. But it never talks about the, the other side of the health equation, which is, is that when you make the cost of uh, heating your home more expensive, then people have to start choosing particularly in the uh, areas that are not as affluent, they have to choose between heating their homes and whether or not they put food on the table. So if we were going to have a real discussion about the health impacts of a particular regulation, I think it shouldn't just talk about 
how the regulation helps, but it should also be looking into how the regulation hurts. Because if we make the cost of fuel go up, whether it be electricity rates or the rate, the cost of gasoline or the cost of uh, fuel oil for people's homes, that has a direct impact on their health. And unfortunately, the language in the amendment proposed does not address that at all. It only looks at the positive side. It doesn't look at the negative side because a lot of these regulations uh, in a real world experience cause problems. We have seen significant increases in the cost of electricity in my district. And as a result of that, I know that there are families out there, and in fact, the Democrat minority leader in the Virginia House of Delegates just last year was railing on the floor about how constituents who live in the 9th District of Virginia and overlap in his district are not able to heat their homes because of the rising electric rates. So I would submit, Mr. Chairman, that we should vote against this amendment, that it doesn't, uh, it, it, it only looks at it one side of that issue. If we wanted to look at all health impacts, including the rising cost of, of energy, et cetera, uh, or the, the cost of, of these um, regulations as it relates to the consumer and the health effects on those consumers, particularly those who are less economically advantaged, then perhaps uh, the amendment might have some merit. But as it is written, it has no merit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back my time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Griffith. Uh, is anyone, uh, Ms. Caps, you're recognized for the uh, purpose of speaking on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to uh, offer my support to the Rush Amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this amendment brings balance to the Train Act. I believe without such balance, the analysis wouldn't be credible or useful. Even with the adoption of this amendment, I would remain concerned that the required analysis may simply not be possible to conduct. But if the balance provided by this amendment is essential, if not sufficient, but the balance provided by this amendment is essential, if not sufficient, to ensuring a high quality and credible product. At the hearing on this bill, Several witnesses expressed concern that the analysis required by this bill would focus only on costs, not on benefits. I appreciate that the sponsors made changes to respond in part to those concerns, but in several ways the analysis remains unbalanced. As currently drafted, important economic impacts like reduction in the number of work and school days missed or reduction in the occurrence of adverse health effects and savings due to decreased use of emergency medical services wouldn't be specifically included. The analysis would consider impacts on small businesses and agriculture, but not vulnerable subpopulations and developing infants and children. The Rush Amendment would correct that imbalance. It would also ensure that the makeup of the committee is balanced by including departments and offices who have expertise in health, disease, and environmental quality. This kind of balance is essential to ensuring a high quality and credible product. So I urge my colleagues to support this amendment to bring balance to this committee and this analysis. And I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Capps. Is there anyone on our side of the aisle that would like to speak on the amendment? I would just make one comment. Uh, when EPA did analysis of the impact uh, of these regulations, they spent a great deal of time and energy looking at health uh, benefits from these regulations. And uh, really, one of the reasons this legislation was introduced is that we did not feel there was a thorough enough analysis for the impact on the economy, on jobs, on global competitiveness, and we felt like that the health benefits had already been thoroughly analyzed by uh, EPA uh, before they issued the regulation. So that's the reason that we did not include it in, in, the, uh, in the bill. Mr. Chairman, would the gentleman yield? Yes, I yield to the gentleman. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's, that's the reason I made my comments, because when we had a hearing earlier, one of the things that was said, I raised that issue about the costs and, and what happened in, when they were looking at some regulations, what happened when you raised those costs on heating, and the administrator basically came back with, and I paraphrased something to the effect of, well, there are programs to help people, we don't want to freeze anybody. But it appeared to me from that statement that there was not, even in the EPA's analysis of the health, while it covered all the things this amendment covered, they did not actually look at what the ramifications would be when the cost to heat your home went up. And that was the reason I made my comments earlier. Well, I, I mean, I agree with you. And th there are so many regulations coming out. I honestly do believe it would be, uh, uh, we would be missing our responsibility if we did not do a complete analysis of the cumulative impact of all these regulations. Um, so with that, 
Yeah, for me, for just one a moment. Uh, I'd be happy to yield to the gentleman. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think you made uh, used the word thorough uh, in your remarks, and I think that's the operative word. We we want to make this this bill uh, as thorough and as comprehensive as we possibly can, and I think it's. Uh, I certainly agree with the gentleman from. Uh, Virginia, I think we have more than, more than, in in common than we have uh, that we that we have uh, that we might disagree on, because obviously he represents a district where there are economically challenged challenge individuals, and so do I. So I'm not, and we have problems in terms of the rising cost of heating in my district too. But this uh, these matters are uh, what I'm uh, what I understand is that the underlying bill addresses these particular matters. Uh, and I'm just asking for some additional uh, concern and additional uh, input from uh, those who are responsible for the overall health, be it from an economic perspective or some other kind of uh, perspective, just the overall health considerations of all the, all the individuals um, and so I think that the gentleman and I are in, in agreement. I, I just wanted the bill to be more thorough and to specifically address the issues of uh, health-related matters. Um, thank you, Mr. Rush. And uh, reclaiming my time, I think that concludes uh, all discussion on this particular amendment. And so we will also roll uh, the vote on this until 1.30. Are there any uh, further amendments to this particular legislation?